before a fall. You know, that's what happens. So, you know, pride is a thing. You know, uh, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. I don't think we read that one. Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goes before, you know, destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. And now when pride gets in there, and devil, he knows how to walk that pride. Because he's been guilty of it from beginning of creation. <laughs> you know. And he, you know, he walked it with him, and he still knows. He even tried to walk it with Jesus. He came to Jesus and said, aren't you the son of God? Command these things, you know, and so forth. You know, you are, you are the son of God already. You know, why go hungry and all that? He tried to appeal to his proud. And then he took him up in a high mountain, showed him a vision of all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Yes, it was a vision, because it was in a moment of time. Showed him that and said, all these things I will give unto you. He appealed to his ego. You know, I, I give all these things to you and so forth like that. All you got to do is do this other thing. You know, worship me and so forth like that. You know, appealed to Jesus' ego. Appealed to him there. One man came to Jesus one time. Appealed to his ego as well. Good master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why callest thou me Good. You know there is none good except God. Amen. <laughs> when people start to praise you, when people start to elevate you, you better quickly reject it and just push it back. Amen. And if you are the one that likes to flatter people, you know, don't set a stumbling block before your brother. If you flatter people and say, oh, you are great and so forth, you are setting a stumbling block before them and if they fall, you will be held responsible as well. Amen, somebody? I know I said it's a sobering message, but it is the truth. You know, so don't set a stumbling block before your brother by you know, telling them you know, things and making their head swell beyond what it should be. Now, this man, he thought he was better than others. Let's look at a story in John chapter 8 real quickly. In John chapter 8, Let's start at verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and so forth. John chapter 8 verse 1. Let's move on you know, to the next verses. And as he began to sit down, people talked to him. Let's look at verse 3. Verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees, this is the one I want to talk about. The scribes and the Pharisees, they brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when he had... They said her in the midst. They said to him in verse 4, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, he commanded us that this such a one should be stoned. But what about you? You know. So they brought her. She was right in the middle of adultery. But I noticed they didn't bring the man. Hello? You know. It takes two to commit adultery, folks. You know. Amen. You know, he probably man was probably maybe one of them and so forth like that, you know. Anyway, Jesus pretended like he didn't hear them. And he began to write with his finger on the ground. Well, I tell you what, Jesus wasn't playing with the sand. <laughs> Amen. It reminds me, you know, in Mount Oreb, there was the finger of God that came with a flaming fire and wrote on the tables of stone. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And began to write all those commandments. The finger of God. And I can see here Jesus writing down on the sand there. Yeah, I don't think he was playing with the sand. He probably was writing those same commandments like he did before. And every one commandment that each one of those people had broken. And he wrote it down. And when he did, <laughs> you know, they were looking at him and said, what is he doing? And every one of them was pricked in their hearts, one by one by one by one. You know, because Jesus wrote all the commandments that they broke. Because he said unto them, you know, the first one among you that is without sin. Never mind whether it is adultery, whether mind it is whatever. If you are without any sin at all, you pick up the first stone and cast it to this woman. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, we are not adulterers, we are not fornicators and so forth. Well, you know, every unrighteousness is sin. Amen? Amen? And he that keeps all the law and breaks in one place is guilty of all. Everything is sin that is sin. You know, so 
But they felt that they were more righteous than this woman. And then finally, when he wrote down on the ground, probably everything he wrote convicted them of their sins. Maybe he even wrote the things that they committed. Who knows? You know. Then one by one, they all went away. And then at the end, Jesus looked in the midst. Only the woman was standing and the Lord said, where are your accusers? And they said, well, Lord, there's nobody accusing me. He said, well, neither do I condemn you. Amen. Go and sin no more. Now, that's always, don't leave that part out. <laughs> you know, go and sin no more. But Jesus did not condemn the woman. Now, i tell you another thing. You know, today, people are so quick to condemn. And again, it's pride. See, when you see somebody who's done something wrong, and you feel you're on your righteous horse, you know, then you condemn them. And you say, well, I don't know why they do those things. You know, there's a lot of things going on in the world today. Does the Bible say we should be condemning the people of the world or praying for them? You know, of course, we should condemn the sin. Jesus always condemned the sin, but not the person. You know, it's a big difference. We don't condone sin. God doesn't condone sin. But he doesn't condemn the people. He wants them to come unto me. Hallelujah. Come unto me. And I will heal you. I will give you life. You that labor and are heavy laden under the burden of sin. And he wants them to come. You know. But what do we do today? People are so righteous today. Sometimes people don't even want God to forgive sinners. Can you believe that? It's in the Bible. You will find a story in Jonah chapter 4. The prophet Jonah did not want God to forgive the people of Nineveh. That's why he ran away from his presence. You can read it in John, the first few verses of John chapter, I mean, Jonah chapter 4. And he ran away because he didn't want, and when God finally, when those people turned to the Lord and began to fast and to pray, and the king commanded everybody, yeah, I wish our leaders would do that today, amen. amen. Command everybody to fast and to pray and to call upon the name of the Lord and to repent. You know, and when the you know, king did that and so forth, 200,000 people began to cry unto the Lord for forgiveness. He said, woman, man, beast, child, anybody should not eat and so forth. Call upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord heard them and turned away the destruction. You know, and this man didn't want them to be destroyed. I mean, they'll be saved. He wanted them to be destroyed. You know, God told him to go and preach repentance. He didn't exactly preach repentance. He preached the judgment. Yet 40 days and you will be destroyed. But God took that anyway. Amen. He touched their hearts. You know, and when God saved those people and changed his mind about destroying them, Jonah was upset with the Lord. <laughs> you know, he got on his righteous horse. I know that you are a God of mercy. I know you will deliver these people. That's why I ran from your presence. Because he doesn't want them to be saved. Can you imagine that? I, I don't know. I mean, one day when I see Jonah, I'm going to say, what were you thinking? Hallelujah. Jesus wants everybody to be saved. Come unto the Lord. And, you know, Bible says, do your sins be as scarlet? You know, God's going to make them like wool. Do they be red like crimson? They shall be white as snow. Can somebody say amen to that? You know, but today, that's not what we see. And when people are even aware of something that somebody has done, they will never let those, that person hear the end of it. You don't even know whether they have repented. You know? But they are going to hold it over their head for the rest of their lives. <laughs> I'm going to read a story to you here before I come to my other story. You know, in the book of Revelation chapter 5, I love this story. Turn with me to Revelation 5 quickly, but I'm going to paraphrase it for you. In the book of Revelation chapter 5, you know, there was a book that had seven seals. The book was written inside and on the back side, seven seals, you know. And there was a great angel that proclaimed, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And John was waiting for an answer. John was thinking maybe one of the prophets of old, one of the apostles, somebody is going to step up. You know, nobody was found worthy. Not a single person was found. Not an angel, not a prophet, not an apostle, not a pastor. Nobody was found worthy to open the book. 
and to lose the seals thereof. And John began to cry. He cried much. And then one of the elders came to him and said, don't weep, John. We got a solution. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. <laughs> and when John turned, he was looking for the lion, but what he saw was a bloody lamb. Hallelujah. He saw a bloody lamb. That's the only person, folks, that holds your salvation in his hands. And if your salvation were left to people, you will never be saved. Because people will never forgive you for anything that you have ever done. They will hold it over your head for the rest of your life. Even when you have repented. But is that the way Jesus did it? Jesus said, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool. I will remove your transgression from you as far as the east is from the west. That's our Jesus. Can somebody say amen to that? Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus for that. I thank God that my redemption is not in anyone's hands. Otherwise, I can't be saved. But I thank God for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, that's just, does that mean that we should continue in sin so that grace may abound? No. That's not what we are saying. God forbid. But, you know, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That's right. God doesn't want us to sin, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And then you confess your sin, you move on. Hallelujah, somebody. And let's not be beating people over the head with something that they've done in the past. Because you don't know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You don't know. God's already moved on. And then at that point, you become an accuser of the brethren. That's what you become. Just like that devil. You know, you don't want to do that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let me bring this down here and begin to move this towards a close. What is it that the Lord requires of you, folks? Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. What is it that the Lord wants of every one of us? Put it up for me, Micah 6. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee. For you to do justly and to love mercy. Have mercy upon your fellow. Have compassion. You know, don't condemn them. Have compassion. And to walk humbly before thy God. Amen. Walk humbly. Don't walk in pride. Don't think you are better than somebody else. You know, don't think you got all the answers, you know. And you know, among Pentecostals, you know, I'm a Pentecostal and I'm proud to be one. <laughs> you know, but among Pentecostals, this thing is so rampant. You know, people that are gifted, they think they are better than everybody else. I've been in fellowships where people that have the word of knowledge or some gift of dream or something else, they think they are better than everybody else. Just because God showed them something, now all of a sudden they think they are better than everybody else. You know, nobody is better than everybody else. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is the one that distributes these gifts as he wants. Praise the Lord. He can raise up stones. You know, John the Baptist began to tell, don't begin to say to yourselves, you know, we are children of Abraham, we are the bride, we are elect. God can raise up these stones if you don't behave yourselves. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, don't think you are better than anybody else. Nobody is better than anybody else. It is by the grace of God. Amen. Now, so because you have a gift and because God showed you something, does that make you holier and better than anybody else? No. You know, consider yourself, lest you yourself fall into sin. You know, he that thinks he's standard, let him take heed. Now, God's wants even against pride. You know, pride is very destructive. Even when Paul was writing to uh, Timothy about how to choose bishops and so forth, he said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, he said, look, don't even appoint a novice. You know, because when he gets there, he's going to be puffed up. <laughs> you know, when he's puffed up, the devil has got him. You know, because any pride in ministry, that's the condemnation of the devil, folks. When, maybe because you sing wonderfully in the praise team. Maybe you are the best uh, soul winner. Maybe you are the best preacher, you know, and so forth like that. You know, any condemnation, you know, any pride that comes in the heart like that, that person will fall into condemnation of the devil, you know, and so on. You know, and sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm the one that, you know, I'm always praying. You know, I'm a prayer warrior. And these other folks don't pray. You know, I don't know what they do with their lives and so forth. <laughs> if you're a prayer warrior, God made you so. Amen. Amen. Who is it that posted of anything that he has? What is it that you have that you have not received? 
If thou didst receive it, then why fought you that boast? God is the one that gave you. You know, if you're a soul winner and others are not a soul, don't worry about anybody else. Just do what God has called you. Amen. People fall into pride by saying, well, you know, we're the only ones winning souls. I'm one of these uh, soul winners action team, so I have to caution myself all the time so I don't say, that, well, why are the other people not? How do you know they're not doing it? Just because they didn't come out to join you? <laughs> you don't know that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, so don't think anything more than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Amen. Now, two quick stories here of how pride can really bring somebody down. You know, the best one I'm going, the best story I'm going to say for the last. You know, but here's one in Acts chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. This man was a great orator. You know, it's like they say, man, you preached a wonderful message. <laughs> you know, and the thing got into his head, you know. Upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and made an oration unto the people. You know, after which the people heard, they said, my goodness, that's the voice of God and not the voice of a man. You know, some people, you know, God used them to do mighty works and they begin to say, oh, you know, I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that's got to be God. That's the angel of God there. And people get filled with that pride inside of them and so on, <laughs> you know. And he didn't give glory to God. God put these things in the Bible. It's not all the time that God does these things. But he puts one or two of them in the Bible as an example. And immediately. Because when that pride got inside his head and they told him that, yeah, you are like the voice of God and so forth. Well, voice of God. Instead of quickly humbling himself to God before God, he pumped himself off. And God immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him. Because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms. And he gave up the ghost. And that's a sobering story. That, and it's in the Bible. And it's true. You know. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then. The, f the best story in the Bible. Is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And many of you know the story. Even it's children in Sunday school. They know this story. It's in the Bible. It's the best one. You know. And so let's. Let's review it. In Daniel chapter 4, verses 29 to 37. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of the world at that time. You know, because, you know, his kingdom ruled the world. You know, and all that. And he had a dream and so forth. And in the dream, you know, perhaps even the interpretation of the dream got into his head. You see? Because there was some dream that he saw. You know, and... You know, he saw the dream, you know, and he was a great tree. And it was interpreted that he was a great tree. He filled the whole earth, you know, and all the birds of the air come and, you know, be under it and so forth like that. And maybe the thing got into his head, you know. Although the person that gave the interpretation warned him, he did not listen, you know. And then at the end of 12 months, even though they already gave him the dream and interpretation, maybe even the dream got into his head. You know, sometimes be careful what dreams you tell people. If you tell them what great things that God's going to use them to do, it might even get into their head. It got into this man's head. And then he walked in the midst of the kingdom. And look at the next, the next sentence. I've always been marveled by this. You know, in verse 30, look at what he said. The king said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power? And for the honor of my majesty. And he strutted his stuff, in, you know, over there and so forth. Like, I mean, I've done all these great things. Hanging gardens and all these things and so forth. Isn't this all the stuff? You know, because they're telling him to humble himself. They say, no, you know, it's all the stuff that I've done. <laughs> well, verse 31. The, while the word was yet in his mouth, there was a voice from heaven. From the watchers, the holy watchers, and the alertas. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. He was still king. They didn't tell him that he's not king. <laughs> but not for very long. To thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed from thee. You know, verse 32. Let's go through it quickly. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy darling shall be with the beasts of the field. You know, and so on. And shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times, as seven years shall pass over you. Until thou know. That the most high ruleth in the kingdom of man and gives it to whomsoever he will. 
Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that. He thought he did all that by himself. Let's look at the next verse. You know, and the same hour the thing was fulfilled, and God changed his body. You know, he went, you know, and he began to grow wings like an eagle, whiskers like a monkey. I mean, this was the king of the world. God turned him into a monkey. God told him to nothing. And he went into the bush <laughs> for seven years. God put that story there in the Bible, folks. Don't think it's folklore or it is uh, fables. It is a true story. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And verse 34. Let's look at it quickly. Verse 34. Now, at the end of the days, after those seven years had passed, I never can answer, lifted up my eyes unto heaven. And my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. Well, this is what he should have done in the first place. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. He should have done that in the first place. You know, whose dominion, hallelujah, is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. I'll tell you something, folks. Those of you that think Nebuchadnezzar was some wicked man or whatever, he gave the most glorious praise. To God in that Bible. After what he went through though. So let's read the rest of it. Verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth. Are reputed as nothing. He found that out. He didn't know that. He thought he was something. All the inhabitants of the earth are nothing before the Lord. And he doeth according as he will. In the army of heaven. Hallelujah. And among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. Or say to him, what doest thou? Oh, every time I read this, I say, my goodness. You know, I wish I could have come up with a story, you know, a praise for the Lord like this by myself. This man, he came up with this and said, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. And they might return my glory unto me and so forth. Now, verse 37. Let's see. He re they returned into his kingdom and he said, now, now, this is the summary of his story. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol. And honor the king of heaven, which if he had done before, he would not have gone through all of that. All whose works are truth, and his ways are judgment. And listen to this last verse. And all those that walk in pride, he is what ready with me. He is able to obey. Now Nebuchadnezzar found that out. If you walk in pride, you know, God will pull it down. And sometimes when things are not working right, maybe there's pride involved. When there is no progress in your life or in the ministry, maybe there has been pride involved. Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. And humility can change a lot of things. I'll give you a closing story here before we pray. There was a man called King Ahab. Some of you may know his story. I mean, when he got into cahoots with uh, Jezebel, they were <laughs> something else, that pair. They did all kinds of evil, you know. And when Elijah, he came up against him, he said, has thou found me, oh, my enemy? Elijah said, yep, I found you. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 20 to 29. 1 Kings 21, verses 20. And Elijah brought a judgment against this man. You know, he's brought all the things, you know, all the prophecies and so forth, what's going to happen and all that, you know. And uh, let's read it through quickly, verse 21. Read with me. Verse 21, let's go through quickly. He said, I will bring evil upon thee, and I will take away thy prosperity, and cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall. That's every man, you know. And him, you know, that is left, you know, shut up in Israel. Verse 22. And he began to do this, and I will make the house of Jeroboam. I mean, he said so many things against him. But let's, let's drop down towards the end and see what God did. You know, I'm rushing through this because of time. At the end of it, you know, look to the next verse, verse 23. Let me just skip through. It spoke of Jezebel and so forth. Then verse 24. Let's keep, let's keep going. He that died of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat and all that. Verse 25. Let's keep going. But there was none like Ahab, which did sell himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, which Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Verse 26, there was none like him. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all the things of the Amorites the Lord, that the Lord cast out before children of Israel. Verse 27. Now, look at all the things that God said about this man being so wicked. But when Ahab heard all the pronouncements of judgment 
And it came to pass when Ahab heard all those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted. It's a wicked man, none like him. But when he heard the word of God against him, he humbled himself and fasted and prayed, you know, and sat in sackcloth. And the Lord said, wow, seest thou how this man Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring, the evil is coming, but I'm going to prolong the evil. The evil will not come in his days, but later on in one of his generations, in his son's days and so forth. Now, humility before the Lord, but pride, he will bring anything down. You know, when you are on the mountain, pride will get you, fall you down quicker than anything else. Sin of pride is a very dangerous thing. It can creep in very small, it starts very small, but it keeps in. The next thing you know, you know, and the Lord just reminded me of something. I didn't quite read it, but he said, go back and read it. Let me turn to Matthew chapter 23, and I will close with that. And let me see if I can find that place. Matthew chapter 23. You know, I'm going to read that, and I'm going to close with that. This was the story he was telling about about the Pharisees. Let's look at verse 5. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5. You know, that's where we started. And he said, this is the thing that they do, but, you know, be careful. Let me see the verse that the Lord wants me to read. I don't know what verse it is. Okay. It's actually in verse 2. Verse 2 is the one he wants me to read. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Well, they don't belong there, but they self-exalted. See? And he just, I was, I didn't even have that marked down in my scriptures that I wrote down here. But the Lord just told me, go back and read that, and I had to look for it. You know, they self-exalted themselves. God didn't really put them there, but they self-exalted themselves to that seat. And they, they wanted to be seen of men and so forth. That's a dangerous place to be. Those kinds of things can creep in very quickly and destroy lives, destroys even marriages. Pride is the thing that destroys marriages because the spouse is too proud, can't even repent and say they are sorry to their spouse, you know, and so forth. You know, it destroys families, pride, you know, so many things. We just destroy families. Now let's be warned in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to stand to our feet and we are going to pray. Like I said, it's a sobering sobering message but we must preach the jubilant message that people shout the victory and so forth i love that more than <laughs> you know you can think i love to preach message where people are jumping up i love it but then again you know sometimes the lord said well you know you got to bring this as well you know so i got to bring that and i didn't preach this to anybody i preached it to the whole church jesus said what i say to one i say to all which is me first this message first you know, to me, examine myself to make sure, you know, there is no pride creeping into my life. Because before you know it, this pride destroys so many things. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray. I want you to take a minute to pray for yourself. And as the praise team comes, don't start any music yet. I want to do this prayer time quietly. You know, I want everybody to pray. What is it that God requires of me but to walk humbly before the Lord my God? Lift up your hands and pray and ask the Lord Jesus. If there's any element of pride, remember, pride brought the devil down from the highest post of any living creature. Pride brought him down and is going down to hell. Pride is a thing that causes us not to advance because God resists the proud. Pride is a thing that makes us feel like we're better than other people. Pride is a thing that makes us not to even forgive others and think that, well, you know, why did they do that and so forth, you know. But God wants us to get rid of that from our heart this morning. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands and now we're going to pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. As we prayed in the beginning, the entrance of your word brings light. And that light, Lord, 
that this word brought into our hearts, let it remain in our hearts every day. Teaching us to humble ourselves, to walk with you in humility, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Knowing that the things which are highly exalted among men, the things that people acclaim and are praised, you know, wonderful preacher, wonderful singer, great man of God, uh, great prayer warrior, and win souls and all these things, all the things that people acclaim, that are highly exclaimed among men, the abomination to God, except we humble ourselves. Father, teach us, Lord, to remember that we are unprofitable servants, and we have only done that which was our duty to do. And most times, we have not even done according to all of our duty. Father, we pray that you have mercy upon us in the name of Jesus. Have mercy upon us in the name of Jesus. Purge the spirit of pride from us, O God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, and we give you all the praise, and give you all the glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. And somebody says, Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember, he whom the Lord loves, he rebukes. Praise the Lord. Excellent Jehovah, marvelous Jehovah, there is no one greater than Jehovah, Lord divine. Excellent Jehovah, marvelous Jehovah, there is no one greater than Jehovah, Lord divine.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for the offering that's been brought in the house of the Lord. Receive all the glory. There is nothing that we have that we did not receive first from you. And out of the abundance of your good treasure that you have given us, we have brought this little into the house of the Lord. Now we ask that you receive it with thanks from our hearts. And Lord, let it be used to the glory of your name in bringing souls to the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Before we close, I want to give a shout out to my little uh, girl there, Precious. <laughs> Praise God. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday. Praise the Lord. Happy birthday. Praise God. Well, of course, we celebrated all the uh, September birthdays already, but uh, today happens to be her birthday, so I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. Well, praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want us to do one more song. It's my choice, please. Um, before we go, and if you know that the Lord has been just gracious to you, I want you to do, I want you to do that song again, you know, Excess Love. You know, I want you to just do it one more time. You know, nobody else would forgive you. No, everybody else wrote you off. But the Lord. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. So sing it with me one more time. Hallelujah.
love of Jesus touches your heart and you want to give your life to Christ. What better time than this in such an atmosphere of love. As they sing that song softly one last time, not so loud. If you want to turn your life over, I say, your love has made me brand new. If you want that brand new thing in your life today. And those of you that are watching in the airwaves, by internet or wherever, we want to give you an opportunity also. Don't let pride of heart or pride of life prevent you from turning your life over to the Lord. One last time, they sing it softly now. Come to the Lord just as you are. If you want to give your life, you just come forward. Or wherever you are, just raise your hands and thank the Lord. When anybody else gave you up, the Lord will never give up on you. Thank you jesus hold the music father we thank you lord for all those that have yielded their hearts to you today no matter where they are no matter where they are listening no matter at what time they are listening to this lord and if your love has touched their hearts and they yield their lives to you today then we give you praise and we give you glory because there's joy in heaven. We thank you, Lord. Blessed be thy name, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Let's share the grace together, everybody. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Now, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the lord forever and ever amen the lord bless you and have a good week uh, crank up that song again one more time <laughs> Oh